94 Hinckley, Minnesota fire that killed uh, hundreds of people, or um, uh, what, uh, in different stars above. That's the story of Sarah Graves, a young bride who's trying to make her way to California. She's part of the ill-fated Donner uh, party and tries to, to hike out of uh, the sea. Boys on the Boat, a number one bestseller, uh, the 1936 Olympic rowing team from the University of Washington, um, you know, working class kids that really aren't expected to do much of, of anything uh, as far as the, the world is concerned, and they take on and defeat Hitler's uh, rowing team as well. Uh, and the same thing with his, his new book, Facing the Mountain, a true story of American heroes in World War II. That tells the story of four Japanese American families and their sons. Their sons went off to, to fight in the war and the soldiers' parents who are immigrants are forced to close their businesses, surrender their homes, move into concentration camps on, on US soil. Um, he personalizes history so that it just makes it fascinating. Joining us tonight is lawyer and author and historian Jonathan Jordan. We're fortunate to uh, have hosted Jonathan. In fact, Jonathan was one of the last authors we had, I think the last author we had for a live talk uh, at the Carter Library for his book, War Queens. We also had him there for Brothers, Rivals, and Victors, and American Warlords. And I think tonight is, gentlemen, it's an appropriate night to be talking about Japanese Americans because the House earlier today passed and sent to uh, President Biden a bill designed to curb hate crimes against Asian Americans. And so, gentlemen, it looks like this is just a, a continuation of the sort of thing that, uh, that Daniel wrote about. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, as Tony mentioned, uh, we are very fortunate tonight to be talking with Daniel James Brown about his new book, Facing the Mountain. Uh, Facing the Mountain uh, is a terrific read. It's one that you can get through in a couple of days if you want to burn through it. Uh, but if you're like me and you like to linger on good prose and, and good scenes, then uh, you'll find plenty of opportunities to do that here. Uh, it is the story of Japanese American heroes in World War II. And as we'll talk in a few minutes, it's uh, something of uh, a tale of, of two generations here. So uh, Daniel Brown, uh, let's start with the title uh, Facing the Mountain. Why did you choose that for the title of the book? Oh, I have to credit my wife, Sharon, for that, actually. Um, I'm terrible with titles, always have been. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it, we got to talking, and one of the central things that this book attempts to do is to come to terms with um, the enormous set of difficulties that Japanese Americans confronted in the wake of Pearl Harbor. This was a time when... Um, they were being incarcerated, they were being forced from their homes, um, they were being forced to sell their possessions for pennies on the dollar, uh, they were being locked up. Um, and at the same time, young Japanese American men, like many other young American men, felt that they should do something and many of them wanted to join the service but they weren't allowed to because they were of Japanese ancestry, even though they were Americans. So there was this complex set of problems that suddenly arose in their path. And, um, and so the, the title is sort of a metaphor for, for that set of problems and how these people dealt with it. Um, it there's other uh, references in the actual uh, military part of it, these guys were always fighting their way up the side of some mountain or another. The, the Germans always held the high ground and, and they always had to be scaling some mountain or another. So it seemed to fit on that level as well. Well, Daniel, the, you've got a number of characters in your book uh, and they, they span a couple of, of, of different tiers of, of Japanese Americans. Are they generally immigrants? Are they native born Americans or both? What's, what's the mix of people we're talking about here? 
Well, I settled on, on four young men uh, as a protagonists, um, but it very much includes the stories of their immigrant parents. Um, so it's really both the, um, the first generation, the Issei generation, and the second generation Americans, the Nisei, um, because I, I really felt it was important to understand um, not just these young men and the dilemma they faced, but what they had come out of and what their parents had gone through in order to become, come to America and try to establish uh, new lives in this country. So it, uh, it interweaves um, those two generations um, and their different experiences. I see. Well, now you've got uh, four pro central characters, you've got their families, but one other character uh, that's, that's not a person it, in some ways is the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Uh, can you tell us what was the 442nd Regiment and why was it special enough for you to write a book that talked a lot about it? Yeah, they were something. Um, was well, I think I, I mentioned um, immediately after Pearl Harbor, yeah, Americans of Japanese descent were not allowed to enlist uh, in in the military. There were some in Hawaii who had already um, been enlisted, and anti discrimination laws prohibited them from being discharged. They eventually became the 100th Infantry um, Battalion all Japanese American who would fight side by side with the 442nd. But the, a year after uh, Pearl Harbor, a little more than a year after Pearl Harbor, the Roosevelt administration reversed course and decided that there was no reason to have all these young men sitting in camps idle, they wanted to serve. So they created this um, essentially all Japanese American fighting unit, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. I say essentially because some of the officers were in fact white, but um, the troops themselves were all Japanese Americans. They were originally all volunteers. Um, many of these young men came out of the, the camps in the, Met in the West, the uh, concentration camps. Others came from Hawaii. And, um, and so it was quite an interesting mix of young men, but they went on to achieve one of the great um, records of any military unit in, in American military history, actually. They were, uh, it took them a while to gel as a fighting unit, but eventually they became an incredibly effective fighting force. Certainly. Now, of the many men who served in the 442nd Regiment and the 100th Battalion, I think I read uh, maybe 12,000 passed through the 442nd. What was it about the four main characters that drew you to them as the kind of uh, the, the square that this, uh, the story revolves around? So I was listening to the oral histories of, there's a project in Seattle called the Den Show Project, which has um, collected and archived the videotaped oral histories of hundreds of Japanese Americans, mostly from the World War II era. And so I, this book actually arose out of my uh, sitting and watching many of those interviews, those oral histories. Um, and as I watched them, um, there were just certain stories that grabbed me. And there were lots of really good stories in, in those interviews, but some of the stories grabbed me more than others. Um, but I also, there were some practical considerations and I needed to have a fairly small number of protagonists so that the book wouldn't become confusing. And there were some practical considerations. I needed certain people that were at certain points um, at, the, the, at the right time to tell the, the, the essential arc of the story. And wherever possible, I wanted individuals whose lives intermeshed or touched at some point along that arc. So it was a long, it took a couple of years actually of whittling down and trying to decide which four, uh, four young men um, I wanted to, to focus on. Mm -hmm. Now the World War II veteran, uh, veterans as we know are really advanced in age. Uh, some of them, I think the youngest would probably be in their mid nineties at this point. And we know that uh, they're, they're uh, passing from, from our world at a rapid rate. Were you able to get a hold or, or reach out to either the families that had memories or any of the veterans themselves to, to draw on any of these, these memories or to get a feel for what you put in your book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's true. Um, 
of the four that I wound up writing about, only one of them, Fred Chiyosaki, was still alive. And um, he was living in Seattle mm -hmm. um, in a retirement home. And his son, Michael, um, helped facilitate my conversations with him. And they were enormously uh, rewarding. Um, there's nothing like sitting down and talking, you know, face to face, eye to eye with somebody whose life story you're about to write to really get, and I'm sure you know this, a deep feeling about who they are, uh, not just the facts of their lives, but who they are as individuals. And Fred, like all four of these guys, turned out to be a really interesting uh, man, just absolutely incredible mixture of um, tenacity and humility, I think I would say. He was a uh, from the time he was a young man uh, growing up in Spokane, Washington, he was a kid that didn't really want to fight, but boy, if he got in a fight, he, he knew how to fight. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if he got his dander up, it was up. Um, uh, so he was just a really interesting character, wonderful man. He unfortunately just passed away about two weeks ago. Um, but um, I, before he did, I was able to get an advanced copy of the book to him. So that was really rewarding uh, for me. Um, so, you know, that they, they, they have been passing away beyond that though, I did make contact with the family members of as many of these guys as I could. Um, the, first of all, the protagonists, but also other people that come into and out of the story on another level. I tried wherever possible to find, um, sons and daughters. For some reason, I find that daughters are particularly, um, they seem to be the one that keep their father's memorabilia and their stories uh, in some ways. So I spent a lot of time with some of the daughters sitting down looking at, you know, scrapbooks and correspondence and photographs and, and those sorts of things. Again, even though the men were gone through the family members, I was able to get a pretty good feel for, for who these guys were, um, particularly who they were as, as young men, which is what I'm writing about. When you spoke to Fred and then some of these other family members, uh, you're drawing memories from a long time before. Did you, as you pulled those memories from Fred, did you sense any bitterness that came with those memories toward what he and his families had been through during uh, 1942 to 43? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say bitterness, um, but um, certainly there, there is still some anger um, in those families um, about the whole experience. There's a great deal of pride, particularly among those that, whose um, father or grandfathers fought in the 442nd. Of course, there's an enormous amount of pride in what the 442nd did. But there's still, you know, there is still uh, a, a, an awareness of what happened to the, to the families uh, in the larger context of being taken away from their homes and, and incarcerated. And as I say, I, I think it's more sort of sense of quiet but righteous anger um, and a determination actually to have their stories told, which was part of why all of these family members, I was surprised actually, because obviously I'm not Japanese American. These families were very willing to open their hearts and tell their stories um, because they, they really wanted me to, to try to help them tell the story of their father or their grandfather. I use whatever skills I have as a storyteller to do that. So, so, um, so the family members were an enormous help also. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes we think of Japanese Americans uh, during that time period as a monolithic block but your book goes into some, some differences, sometimes subtle, sometimes not, between the Japanese Americans in Hawaii and those on the West Coast. Um, did the Japanese Americans in Hawaii have markedly different experiences from the West Coast uh, evacuees or internees? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, the, the kids, I call them kids because they were at the time, the, these young men from Hawaii, um, many of them, most of them grew up in plantation towns or on sugarcane plantations um, uh, on the outer islands. And, um, and, and you know, the plantation system in Hawaii was pretty brutal. It was very racially stratified and the working conditions were horrific. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of racism. Um, so those kids grew up 
in Hawaii, though, with a certain sort of Hawaiian attitude, um, they all spoke pidgin English, um, which is the common language in Hawaii. And, um, and so when, and when they wound up at basic training in Camp Shelby, Mississippi, they ran into all the kids from the mainland. Some of these uh, young men on the mainland had come out of the camps in order to enlist and serve. Um, and those young men, by and large, had, some of them had grown up on farms, but most of them had grown up um, in you know, Los Angeles, going to UCLA, or in some small town in the American West, helping their parents run a laundry. Uh, they had grown up in sort of more or less typical American middle class um, backgrounds. And, and so they had a very different sort of life experience, set of life experiences than the guys from Hawaii. When the two groups uh, tried to merge at Camp Shelby, it was like mixing oil and water. Within the first few days, there were fistfights breaking out all over camp. Uh, one of the principal problems was that the, uh, the, the, the mainland guys could not understand what the Hawaiians were saying. The Hawaiians would only speak in this pidgin English. And the mainlanders just didn't know what they literally didn't know what they were saying, which made the, the Hawaiians mad because they felt that like they were being disrespected. And though that whole thing sort of spiraled out of control and was a source of a lot of friction. And then also um, the guys from Hawaii had almost no awareness of these camps and the fact that the mainland um, families had been incarcerated. That didn't happen in Hawaii. And so they were barely aware that these camps existed, whereas most of the mainland kids had either come out of the camps or had close relatives who were in the camps. And, um, and, and they had a really serious attitude about it. They were, they were angry. They, they were in the army because they wanted to prove something. And the Hawaii guys didn't really understand that. They wanted to have play, have fun, hang loose. Um, so that would that was another source of sort of misunderstanding, and that finally got reconciled when um, actually one of the chaplains, uh, Chaplain Haguchi, I think, thought, well, okay, the Hawaii guys don't understand what's going on in these camps. There happened to be a couple of these camps in Arkansas, so the army started putting the Hawaii guys on buses and taking them to these two camps in Arkansas, and the Hawaii guys were just absolutely shocked. They were in uniforms, American army uniforms, but they were frisked before they could go behind the barbed wire into these camps. And they were just horrified by, by seeing these camps. So when they came back to the base, that's when things began to get better between the two groups. Well, Daniel, you've, um, we've, we've talked about the interning of uh, Japanese Americans and, and that's, that's one of the stains that carries throughout uh, not only uh, facing the mountain, but throughout uh, American history. Uh, but you mentioned a moment ago that in Hawaii, the center of the Pearl Harbor attack, there were no internees. And that was part of the friction between, I think you've got a chapter called Katonks and Buddha Heads. Yeah. And um, that was part of the friction there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why the US government intern people in the West Coast? Why did they leave Hawaii alone? And were there any misgivings among the American officials when they entered these orders that mass shipped people into concentration camps? There was quite a bit of debate within the Roosevelt administration about whether to do that or not. Um, eventually, the, the military argued very strongly for um, incarcerating all the Japanese Americans living along the West Coast, and they, there was an exclusion zone. If you lived west of, or east of that zone, for instance, in Washington State, if you lived east of the uh, Columbia River, you were not incarcerated. But the military argued that although they were Americans, uh, well, the, the, sons, the sons and daughters were Americans, they argued that anybody of Jan Japanese ancestry represented a military threat to the United States because um, there were so many military bases along the West Coast. Um, and so that was the, the rationale that the, the, um, the military advanced to the Roosevelt administration and in the long run, they prevailed. Um, the, um, nobody was incarcerated in Hawaii. Well, that's not quite true. The Issei, some of the first generation 
um, men in Hawaii who the FBI deemed as suspicious were taken into a separate kind of custody. They were taken into DOJ custody. Mm -hmm. But by and large, uh, the vast majority of the Japanese American and Japanese population in Hawaii was not incarcerated because something like 35% of the population of Hawaii was of Jap Japanese ancestry. And um, as a practical matter, the, the island simply couldn't function if you took a third of the population uh, out of the equation. So it was a practical, uh, practically impossible um, to, to do that. And so, um, and, and so they didn't, as I say, only uh, uh, several hundred, well, several hundred, quite a few actually, you say first generation men were incarcerated there. Mm -hmm. And as a practical matter, probably I suspect the shipping was would have also been difficult to move them back to the West Coast and then to the mountains. Right. Which is what they, they actually did do with these Issei men. They put them um, in the steerage of, of you know shipping boats and, and took them to the West Coast and then across the country. They were putting camps. Uh, many of them were kept at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. They were kept in DOJ and or military prisons around the country um, for the duration, many of them for the duration of the war. Now, you mentioned that the military's argument were that these people of Japanese uh, descent, whether uh, first generation American Nisei or immigrant Issei, were a military threat. They prevailed, but was there any real evidence that any of them posed a significant threat to us? No, no, and there has never been unveiled, even in retrospect, any sabotage or espionage by uh, immigrants or, or Nisei. You know, there were people, there were Japanese nationals living in the embassies who no doubt were uh, doing spying as the staff of embassies typically do. But among the immigrant population and their more American born um, children, there was no evidence of any uh, sabotage or uh, espionage. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, the, the mass of people, I think it was somewhere around, was it 120,000 roughly? Roughly, the, the, it's a little hard to come up with an absolutely firm number, but it's something between 110 and 120,000 people. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that they were placed in concentration camps. And for the benefit of our audience, uh, you, you go, take some pains in the introduction to tell, tell everyone, your audience, what you mean by that. So make sure there's, there's no misunderstanding. Um, when you say concentration camps, you're, you're not talking about like an Auschwitz type place. Right. Yeah, I want to be very clear about that. I'm in no way equating these camps with the Nazi death camps or slave labor camps. Um, but I think it's important to use honest language around something like this. When the Japanese Americans were incarcerated, um, and you notice I used the term incarcerated rather than intern, uh, there were a number of terms that the government put out. The, the places they were first taken were these fairgrounds. They were um, often kept in horse stalls in very primitive living conditions. The government called those assembly centers. They called the camps out in the deserts um, relocation centers. They, the government put this whole set of language out there around this event that sort of softened it and shielded it. So I think it's really important to use the correct terms. And these were in fact concentration camps. They were designed to concentrate a population of people along racial uh, and ethnic lines um, and to segregate them from the rest of the population surrounded in most cases by barbed wire. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt himself called them before the war actually sort of prospectively talking about what might happen. He called them concentration camps himself. Mm -hmm. And how long were the uh, were, were the citizens in car citizens and their their immigrant parents incarcerated? in these camps? Well, it varied quite a bit actually uh, by, the, by camp and by situation. Um, some, some young people, for instance, were able to leave almost immediately if they were students and they could um, get a university in the Midwest or the East to enroll them. Maybe they'd been a student at Berkeley or UCLA. Um, if, a, if a college in the East or the Midwest would enroll them, they were able to leave um, to enter college um, 
in the Midwest or the East. And over time, the WRA, the War Relocation Authority, gradually began to relax some of the, um, the restrictions on, on the camp. So it sort of evolved over time and it wasn't uniform from place to place. But the vast majority of people had no place to go other than the camps. They couldn't go back to their homes on the West Coast. They had no jobs, they had no homes, they had no prospects of jobs anywhere else in the country. And the country was deeply hostile to them. So it, it, it was as a practical matter, they couldn't just pick up even when they were finally allowed to and get on a train and go to you know Iowa or someplace. It just, in almost no cases, was that a practical reality. So the vast majority of them um, wound up having to stay in the camps for the duration, almost the full duration of the war. Well, Daniel, you talk about a hostile country. Their homes were effectively, they were sealed off from their homes. They may not have known that whether they had a home to go back to in many cases. But then you said that there were Nisei who came out of the camps uh, or from families that were in camps and volunteered to serve that same country that was incarcerating them. Why did these Nisei volunteer to serve? Yeah, now I should, you know, so I should first start off by saying this was a topic of hot debate among the young men in the camps, whether to enlist or not to enlist. And um, it caused deep rifts. It caused rifts that are still alive in some families today, this issue of whether to enlist or to resist. Um, those, so, but I'll stick just with those who enlisted for now. Those who enlisted um, had various motives. Mostly, many of them simply wanted, like any other American uh, young man, they wanted to to serve their country. They were deeply American and they thought it was the right thing to do. Some of them felt that, um, well, we can prove our loyalty by fighting and suffering and perhaps dying on battlefields in Europe. Um, if that's what it takes to prove our loyalty, that's what we will do. Some, I suppose, were just young men that wanted adventure as young men often do going off to war. Um, so they, there were a variety of motives. Um, as I say, it was a very hard sell in these camps. Uh, there were people who were not in the camps, as I say, living outside the exclusion zone, like Fred Shiyosaki, who tried to enlist immediately. And when the 442nd was created, he did enlist immediately. That was an easier sell for somebody like him than somebody who was literally in one of these camps, seeing what was happening, you know, whose father was despondent because He'd lost his business and his mother was despondent because she was cut off from her, her, her family. That was a really hard sell, but still many of these young men did, did enlist out of the camps. I, I, you had an interesting scene where there are two brothers talking about who's gonna go enlist to represent the family. And I thought it was interesting that these families that have been put in such a difficult position almost seemed in some cases to have a collective sense that we've got to go represent, I don't know if it's the honor of the family or the goodwill of the family, but, but these young men stepped up and, and did what their parents were unable to do because they were incarcerated. Yeah, actually, and because these families were of Japanese ancestry, actually honor was an important part of it. Family honor was an important part of it. So those, those two brothers you referred to were, were typical in some ways. They both, um, they were the, there were several other brothers in the family, but they, for various reasons, couldn't serve. Um, so there were two brothers who reasonably could serve. They stayed up all night arguing, no, no I'm going to go. No, I'm going to go. I need to go because, no, I need to go because argued literally all night long. And in the end, um, both of them signed up because they, they felt the family had to be represented, um, that it would be dishonorable if the family weren't represented and neither would give of it to the other. Um, so, so they both, both wound up going. Well, Daniel, signing up was not the only thing they needed to do to get into the army. They, did you find that they had uh, additional barriers to cross before they could put on a, a GI uniform? Uh, yeah, I mean, there were, there were all kinds of physical requirements, of course, um, and there were um, uh, 
you know, it was, it was, how do I say this? It was a, um, it, there were a lot of disputes within families. So part of the challenge for these young men who decided to go was that often their parents did not want them to go. And frankly, in some case, their parents, they had been born in Japan. They, may, they, they had split loyalty themselves. But nevertheless, the, these young men who wanted to go had to convince their fathers that I don't care if you, you know, I'm going to go. It was a very hard thing in a Japanese family to, um, to disregard your father's wishes in particular. Um, so that was often a barrier to simply getting to the enlistment center. And, and your book talks about loyalty oaths that the Japanese uh, Americans had to sign. And it seems like if you're trying to prove your loyalty, that would be an easy thing to do. But not everybody felt the same way about having to sign something specific, did they? Right. And so this, this is where the resistors come into play. Um, as I say, far from all these young men in the camps volunteered. At a certain point, everybody of Japanese ancestry, this was the point at which actually they began to, to draft, to conscript uh, young Japanese American men. Um, they required everybody of Japanese ancestry to sign a loyalty oath, basically loyalty to the United States, disavowing any other loyalty, which for many of them was an easy thing to do. But there were a large number of young men who refused to sign that loyalty oath, not because they were disloyal, but because they were being required to sign a loyalty oath that no other Americans were being required to sign. I mean, that, that simple fact, the fact that they had to sign this form simply because their ancestry was Japanese, whereas the vast majority of other Americans Nobody was putting a loyalty form in front of them. That caused large numbers of them to refuse to sign that. They became called no-no boys. Um, and uh, they were eventually, they were incarcerated in separate facilities because they were checked off as disloyal, which in, in, in almost all cases was simply not true. They just refused to sign on principle. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Now, uh, you mentioned that the 442nd began training in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, I take it Hattiesburg was not the kind of town back in the 1940s that was necessarily prepared for a large influx of uh, Japanese Americans. Can you tell us about how the, uh, how the characters in your book made it through and adjusted to that new environment? Must have been new to them too. It, it was new to them and utterly shocking to them, particularly the guys from Hawaii, because although it's stratified, Hawaii was a racially diverse place. Um, when, when they arrived uh, at the train station in Hattiesburg and they saw these, you know, um, signs, um, coloreds and whites for restroom facilities and drinking fountains and things like that, they, they were, first of all, they didn't know which they should use. <laughs> there was a tremendous amount of confusion at the railroad station that first day. They didn't know if they should use the white restroom or the colored restroom. And, and, but, but that was also just a shock to them. They, had, they didn't know that this kind of thing happened in America. And, um, and as far as the locals were concerned, the, the, the authorities, their white commanders were, were quite concerned actually about their safety. Uh, they actually kept them all in the base for quite a few weeks. They didn't let them wander out into Hattiesburg until the people of Hattiesburg had a chance to get used to the idea. And, and a lot of the governments in the South, a lot of the um, local governments were, were not happy uh, about having them there, frankly. But, you know, it, there, were, there, and there were a few incidents of violence actually that occurred. Um, but mostly it, it was from the viewpoint of the 442 soldiers, it was just shocking to them um, that um, this sort of, they hadn't seen the Jim Crow uh, uh, in action and really weren't aware of it. But they, they, some of them were able to win over some of the, say, restaurant and, and diners uh, owners little by little. Did they make inroads? Yeah, they did. Um, you know, these were, these were earnest young men. Um, and um, they, they did make inroads within the local community and things worked out. In Hattiesburg itself, um, 
there were, I don't remember any incidents of violence or anything like that directed against them in Hattiesburg. Well, after training, the 442nd, I believe, went off to Europe. Uh, did the Army have uh, some, some concerns or distrust of the 442nd if they had sent them off to the Pacific to fight other Japanese? Yeah, they may have. You know, I, to the honest answer, I don't know to what extent they didn't trust them. I, I do know that to some extent they were concerned about them. They were concerned about putting Americans with Japanese faces onto the ground in the Philippines or any place else like that for fear that if they were taken prisoner, they would be, you know, abused terribly. So, so there may have been some of both of those. Um, they didn't, they deliberately did not send 442 to the uh, Pacific theater. Although I should mention that there was also, uh, there were a large number of Japanese Americans who were recruited into the MIS, the Military Intelligence Service. Those uh, young men who had good Japanese language skills were considered very valuable. And so um, if their language skills were good enough, um, they were actively recruited into the MIS, and many of them served in the Pacific Theater. Most of them behind the lines, listening to radio transmissions, uh, translating material, interrogating prisoners. Um, some, though, did actually see action on the ground, again, acting as interpreters, interrogating prisoners on the ground. But the vast majority and the, four, the entirety of the 442nd um, went to the European theater. And in the European theater, Daniel, the 442nd, I think you alluded to earlier, went on to become one of the most decorated units in all of American military history in any war. I think I read uh, like 28 medals of honor, hundreds of, of bronze and silver service stars, distinguished flying crosses, and thousands of purple hearts. Yes. Can you, can you trace the route of the 442nd through its tour in Europe, so we have an idea where they were fighting. Yes, absolutely. Um, they were landed at um, uh, in southern Italy um, at Naples, um, and well, some were landed on the other side of the peninsula. But they they were uh, they congregated in Naples and then moved immediately up to Anzio, and this was at the time when the Amer the Allies were just breaking out of the beachhead at uh, Anzio, so they just arrived after the breakout. They, um, they followed the rest of the Fifth Army north. They raced through Rome and wound up fighting their way north um, from just uh, north of Rome, fighting their way north up the uh, western coast of Italy. So they, they, fought, they fought through Tuscany, a series of um, battles in, for hilltop towns, basically, some from very heavy fighting. Uh, as far north as um, the Arno River. Um, they were, then they were pulled back and they were shipped to uh, Marseille and transported by train to Northern France to the uh, French German border, the Vosges Mountains, the Vosges Forest, um, where they saw extraordinary fighting and really the, um, the climactic battle of the four forests Two's um, history takes place in the Vosges forest. Um, so they, they fought then uh, there, and then they were um, withdrawn and brought back to Italy, where they, <laughs> they had a brief respite called the Champagne Campaign, where they actually were stationed along the Riviera and uh, had, a, had a pretty good time for a couple of months. But then they were shipped back to Italy and they picked up where they had left off, basically just north of the Arno, fighting their way north again uh, into more and more mountainous country. And uh, they eventually broke, helped break through what was called the Gothic line, this formidable German defensive line. And from that point, they basically chased the Germans north the rest of the way uh, up into the Po Valley where the war ended. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how the 442nd Regiment's war record and the 100th Battalion you mentioned earlier left an impact on American attitudes towards Japanese as people we can trust and people who will fight for their country just like white and black Americans? So, you know, I think it did have an impact, um, especially at the time. Um, there was, as I say, this climactic battle in the Vosges Forest. And after that battle, there was a lot of newsreel footage of the 442nd um, 
very positive coverage in the newsreels in the movie theaters. And uh, those moves, newsreels, by the way, were, were shown in France and liberated parts of Europe um, where the Nisei soldiers were greeted as, as heroes. But they were also shown back home in the States. And they, they certainly had an effect. There was a lot of good press given to the 442 in the, you know, during the war and immediately after the war. It's hard to say that that had a lasting effect though on the American consciousness. I mean, the reality is most of them still went back to towns, particularly in the American West, where they still faced the same kind of discrimination that they had faced before the war. Certainly with some exceptions, I'm sure what they had done um, had, had eased the way for some of them, but they still faced a great deal of, of um, of, you know, hatred um, when they returned. Well, and in talking about the long-term impact, earlier you mentioned Densho, uh, the organization. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what its goal is in terms of a long-term impact on our attitudes? Yeah, so Densho, as, um, Densho, as I say, is run by uh, Tom Makeda in Seattle, and it was the source of most of, not all, but most of the material in my book, the firsthand uh, of counts. Um, Tom, Tom's been collecting these oral histories of Japanese Americans for 25 years, recording them, archiving them, and he makes them available to the public at densho.org. Anybody can go to densho.org and watch thousands of hours of these recorded oral histories of both Issei and Nisei, mostly Nisei talking about um, their World War II experiences. Um, so it, Tom's prov has provided a really valuable service for people like me and writers and historians for generations to come, I'm sure, because as you mentioned, these, these men, uh, well, the, and women, everybody of that generation, they are passing away and uh, their stories will be lost except for those that, um, that have been captured at places like Densho. So it's been, a, it's been a really useful tool for me, but it also serves a much bigger public um, purpose. A lot of schools and educators and other institutions work with Densho to develop a curricula about Japanese American experiences. And, and so it's, it's become a more and more of a um, valuable source to a number of other organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, Densho has done a, a, a wonderful job of preserving the legacy of these stories, but uh, Facing the Mountain has done a fantastic job of taking some of those stories, bringing them together, and weaving it into something that is part war story, part story of intern uh, internees and, and incarcerated citizens. Uh, I believe it was Secretary of War Henry Stimson who said in his diary, that this will tear a hole in our constitution if we put people into camps solely based on their race. And, and we did that. And we're still living with some of that legacy. So uh, this has been a marvelous discussion. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, Daniel. But I think now is the time when uh, Tony Clark can tell us yes. if we've got any questions that people would like to uh, hear from you about. Yes. In fact, um, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box in the uh, on the at the bottom of the screen. Uh, one question, Daniel, um, one person wrote about an internment camp that is in Hawaii. Uh, they referred to it as Hell Valley. And they were confused because you all had mentioned, you know, perhaps no internment camps there or maybe different. That's, that's true. Um, that was located just outside Honolulu. And it was a particularly vicious place. It was also kept at uh, uh, pr Japanese prisoners of war were kept there for a time. D I should be clear, there were people interned in Hawaii, um, but they were interned selectively um, or incarcerated selectively. There was no mass incarceration of people simply because they were of Japanese descent. The actually before the war, started, the uh, FBI had created a list called the, of actually categorizing people who might be cons considered suspicious if a war broke out. And so it was a ridiculously broad 
uh, brush thing, Buddhist priests and um, people who perhaps ran the local Japanese language uh, newspaper, um, people that wrote too frequently to the Japanese consulate to inquire about relatives, all kinds of people were caught up and in, uh, in this list of uh, suspected um, Japanese nationals. So some of those people did wind up in that, uh, I can't, I'm not sure I could pronounce the name of the camp correctly, but um, it was, yes, it was right outside of Honolulu. Right. Uh, Daniel, uh, taking, uh, taking that for uh, uh, one other step, um, you know, we hear these stories about like these, uh, you know, scares of Japanese bombers and, and you know, the anti-aircraft uh, batteries in Los Angeles start shooting in the dark at night. Did you get a sense that in on the West Coast, California and other places, there was a, among the public, there was just a hysteria that contributed to the FBI's broad sweep? Yeah, there absolutely was hysteria. I mean, there was a war hysteria. I, I remember my parents living through that. And I remember them, although they were extremely sympathetic uh, to the Japanese Americans, uh, they, they recalled in you know, vivid detail to me when I was young, um, what it was like those first days and weeks after Pearl Harbor. People did in fact expect that Japanese um, bombers would appear over San Francisco and that Japanese Navy might appear off Los Angeles at any time. Pearl Harbor had been such a stunning surprise that there was you know, a great deal of skepticism about the American military's ability to predict when and where Japanese Imperial troops might suddenly show up. So there was real fear. And that certainly did contribute, that sort of hysteria contributed to what happened. But I think what's, what's shameful is that um, as time went on, actually the, the determination to incarcerate this huge swath of population didn't diminish, it actually grew stronger. The American people were overwhelmingly supportive of incarcerating Japanese Americans. So it was politically easy to do. Well, and during the time that these internships and incarcerations increased, the war front was getting farther and farther away, wasn't it? Uh, May of 1942 is the Battle of Coral Sea, midway a month later, the war seems to be going in one direction, but incarceration may have been going in a different, darker direction. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean is that, you know, we, by the time of Midway, it was pretty clear that, well, in some ways, the tide of war was already turning in the Pacific, but at least Japan was beginning to be on the defensive. And the idea of a Japanese invasion of the mainland or of Hawaii um, became, you know, pretty, pretty ridiculous at a certain point. But nevertheless, the incarcerations continued. And, you know, what's the bottom line also is that these were American citizens that were being incarcerated. I mean, that's really the most fundamental, excuse me, fundamental problem with what happened is that it, uh, it did in fact open a hole in the constitution and I'm not sure it's ever been entirely repaired. Daniel, you, you talk a lot about the fighting, the heroics of the, uh, the soldiers, but you also write about a pacifist. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so I, that's important actually. Of the four young men that I um, follow, um, three served in the 4-2. Four, four the, the, the fourth was a Gordon Hirabayashi, who was a conscientious objector um, even before the war and a Quaker. But Gordon, um, Gordon is a very, very interesting young man, um, interesting all his life, in fact. Um, there was a curfew, uh, just to create a context, it was a curfew was imposed on anybody of Japanese descent in Seattle, as in many cities along the West Coast uh, after Pearl Harbor, an 8 p.m. curfew. First thing Gordon did was, he was a student at the University of Washington he decided he wasn't going to obey the curfew. And in fact, he began to keep a journal documenting his defiance of the curfew, documenting times when he was out past 8 p.m. And then when um, the time came for the Japanese Americans uh, in Seattle to be put on buses and taken away to one of these camps, um, Gordon just didn't get on the bus. Instead, he sat down and he wrote 
a very carefully articulated uh, statement addressed to the FBI, laying out in constitutional terms why he believed both the um, curfew and the incarcerations were unfair and unconstitutional. He wrote this statement out. He took himself downtown Seattle, at, walked into the FBI's office, handed them statement uh, to them, and turned himself in. So he spent the remainder of the war in various legal battles and in and out of detention facility. He was actually put first in the King County Jail in Seattle. Then he wound up in a work farm in Tucson, Arizona, and finally in a federal prison in Washington state. His, his legal case though, worked its way all the way up to the US Supreme Court, where actually he lost, um, which is actually a significant, significant issue for us today because Hirabayashi was pretty obviously a badly decided case. Um, he lost the case at the Supreme Court. In the long run, decades later, his, his conviction uh, was vacated, but the case was never actually overturned. And in an even longer run, after Gordon died, uh, President Obama awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his principled stand against um, the incarcerations. Well, you know, that kind of leads me to... Um another uh, question. And, you know, we've heard so much about African Americans serving in the military, and then coming home and even in uniform, um, being disrespected, uh, being beaten, uh, and abused. What happened to the Japanese Americans when they came home as war heroes? Yeah, it varied, of course. But um... Well, I'll give Fred Shiyosaki, one of the uh, young men that I chronicle, um, not long after he got home, uh, took a young woman out, a Japanese American woman out on a date and immediately what called a Jap uh, by somebody in the movie theater. And Fred being what he was, he went at him with his fists. That happened a lot. The, the, the racism, the, the hostility was still there. And even for men who were in uniform were sometimes abused um, simply because they had Asian faces or what were perceived to be Japanese faces. So it didn't, you know, it was very mixed, but a lot of them continue to experience outright um, violence and, and racism, even when it was known that they were had served in the, in the military. Sort of, um, uh preview of what we see today. Yeah, there have been a lot of echoes, you know. <laughs> the whole time I was writing this book, I mean, I started to write this book um, just about the time that the preceding administration came into power. So when I was um, researching um, these uh, immigrants from Japan, these hardworking families trying to make their way to America and make their way in America, there was all this anti-immigrant rhetoric um, happening in this country. When a little later I was researching and writing about the families torn apart by the incarcerations and the dislocations, um, it was the same time that families were being torn apart on our Southern border. Um, the, same time that I was reading about all these um, racist sort of tropes and images that um, were hurled against them right after Pearl Harbor. Um, some of those same tropes and images and phrases were being hurled against people just in the last couple of months, actually. We've seen outbursts of that again. So there have been echoes, you know, between what I was reading and researching about and what's been happening in my own world since I began this project. What about leadership in in Washington during this time to say, to stand up for the rights of, of all, all Americans? Uh, in the time of Franklin Roosevelt or in the time yeah. of our, yeah. Well, I, yeah, because I think you might be able to make a comparison there as well. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in a family that absolutely adored Franklin Roosevelt. Like a lot of, um, like a lot of families at the time, we had a portrait of FDR uh, hanging in our house. 
Um, and I still, I have a huge amount of admiration for, for FDR, I really do. Very few presidents have been confronted with what he was confronted with. And, and he dealt with enormous difficulties with great success. This clearly was a blemish on his record. I mean, I don't think there's any way to see it. Um, incarcerating American citizens against their will, simply on the basis of their ethnicity, just sticks that hole in the middle of the constitution. You just can't get around that. And Franklin Roosevelt should have known that. You know, Eleanor, I can't document this in enormous detail, but I know Eleanor was, uh, was pretty appalled actually by what was happening. I know she spent a lot of effort visiting the camps after they were created. And I believe she was actually quite opposed to the, uh, to the incarcerations. So what it says about our current day, I know, I think it's obvious that the last four years have been a slide backwards um, in terms of um, all these issues surrounding race and ethnicity and what it means to be an American and what rights uh, should come along with being an American. Yeah, Jonathan, you wrote about uh, FDR in, in uh, American Warlords and then also your, your rival's book. Did he, was there ever any excuse, explanation for the, the kinds of, of things that uh, Daniel writes about? What I found, and, and Daniel, I don't, I don't know if you've seen any traces of this in, in your works as well. Roosevelt, when he found something that was uncomfortable to talk about, he liked to shy away from it. He delegated, he, he signed executive order 9066. Um, he delegated everything to the war department. And I think he made a comment according to Henry Stimson's diary that said, be as reasonable as you can. But, you know, Eleanor was really, as Daniel, as you said, she was the conscience of the administration. She was the, the, the better angel of, of Roosevelt's nature. And Roosevelt viewed himself as, I've got a war to win, and that's always got to be job one. It, it was a very difficult time. And I got to say, Daniel, the way you portray these folks stepping up, uh, notwithstanding what they had to face, is, it's, it's quite an incredible story because forgiveness and reconciliation in the face of that kind of hostility is, some, is, is one of those noble virtues. And we lionize bravery, we lionize you know, being willing to fight, but, but so many of the characters in your book were able to find that almost forgiveness uh, that, that made, makes facing the mountain a really magical story. No, I agree. I think that was sort of a unifying theme amongst the people that I met and I talked to. Um, as I, you know, hearkening back to what we said earlier, I, I, I just wouldn't use the word bitterness to describe how folks now feel about this, but I definitely would use the word righteous anger. Um, they were, they, th th these people were wronged. Um, their fathers, their grandfathers were wronged. They want the world to know it. And, um, and that's a, you know, that's a good place to be. Daniel, I, I mentioned at the, uh, the start how your books have uh, you have the ability to write, to personalize through personal stories, history. So, so what's on tap next? <laughs> um, nothing for a while. <laughs> These, you know, <laughs> this book took five years to write. And um, so I will see if something grabs me in the next year or so, but I'm going to be talking about this book a lot for the next year. And um and then we'll see. I, I just I don't really have any immediate plans. Well, you'll have an, everyone will have an opportunity to not only get uh, facing the mountain, but with uh, with Daniel's autograph book plate from Acapella Books. In fact, we could not do this program uh, without uh, the uh, the partnership with with Acapella Books with Frank and Lauren and all the the good folks there. So I would encourage you to. Um, get his book, Facing the Mountain, or, and I misstated the title earlier, Boys in the Boat, rather than on the boat, uh, his New York Times uh, number one bestseller, Acapella Books has those uh, available for you. Gentlemen, this has been 
a, uh, a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, just, I can't thank you all enough for uh, spending the evening with us, uh, with us tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for watching. Uh, and we'll be back and Acapella Books will be back. Uh, and if you, if you have friends that missed it, all you need to do is go to the uh, Jimmy Carter Library uh, YouTube channel or Facebook page and same with Acapella Books so that they can watch it and get excited about this book as well. So thank you all very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Tony. Good night.